Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our March 19th Webster Board of Education meeting. Would you please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May we please entertain a motion to move out of executive session? All in favor? Thank you. Board members, you've had a chance to take a look at the agenda. Being unaware of any changes or alterations to the agenda, may we have a motion to accept the agenda as listed? Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Motion carries. We provide an opportunity at this time for the public who have registered with the board clerk to address the board. Uh, we ask that any comments be brief, no longer than five minutes, and related to school matters. Personnel matters, whether directly or indirectly, will not be discussed in public. If you do have a personnel concern, we ask that you address it in writing to the board. So with that being said, is there anyone in the audience tonight who wishes to address the board? Okay, we'll move on wait, then. Wait, 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 wait. Ooh, ooh. Did you want to come up there in the uh, WTA right. time? Let's come up during WTA liaison. That'd be great. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, we'll move on then to our student liaisons. <laughs> scary there. <laughs> I'm scary? Yes. You were scaring people. He scares me. You scare me. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Maria and Mary. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope I don't scare you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's scary. I'm a, I'm a little teddy bear. <laughs> it's your choice of who would like to start. <laughs> okay. Good evening, board members. I'm glad to be back sharing with you all the great things happening at Thomas. I just finished my driver's ed course. Um, which met every Thursday night for the past six weeks. So I thank Lorenzo for being so flexible with our schedules. Speaking of Lorenzo, he's about to take, the play, take on the stage, playing the role of Herman, the club owner, in our spring musical, Sweet Charity. The students had an opportunity to see the teaser yesterday afternoon, and let me say, you don't want to miss Lorenzo's amazing dance moves. <laughs> After tonight, there are three more performances of the show at 7.30 on Friday and Saturday night, and 2 o'clock matinee on Saturday. You can purchase tickets for $10 at Hagedorn's or online at WebsterThomasPlayers.com. I hope you get to t a chance to see this great show. In the world of sports, our spring teams are in full swing. Due to the great weather we've been having, our athletic office had to think outside the box for practices and tryouts. Maybe you saw on Twitter when the girls across team became a little impatient with the lack of snow melting on the turf, so they did their part to clear the field by rolling massive snowballs. Many of our winter sports teams have been recognized as New York State Scholar Athlete teams, including cheerleading, boys and girls basketball, ice hockey, boys and girls indoor track, co-ed Nordic ski, and girls and boys bowling. Our wrestling coach, Mr. Neil Cook, was named Coach of the Year. Gabriella Vasile, an alpine skier, is a defending Class A Section 5 champion and the defending New York State champion. A big congratulation goes out to her. Also, Titan senior girls basketball player Candace Crawford was selected to play in the Ronald McDonald House All-Star Game on March 28th at 1 p.m. at Rush Henrietta High School. The class of 2015 is hoping to start a new tradition at Thomas with a Senior Spirit Week. There will be dress-up days after school events all week from April 13th through the April 17th. And on April 17th, they are planning to have a lock-in while they will stay overnight at Thomas. The whole senior class is very excited. Thank you, Mr. Gamina, for coming to support the rivalry on the Ridge. This was a faculty basketball game held on March 6th between Thomas and Schrader with an amazing halftime show from the real Thomas dance team, our male teachers who danced to Beyonce's single ladies. <laughs> <laughs> the dance team definitely. It, really, it was probably the best part of the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> the event was a huge success and raised almost $5,000 for the Webster Miracle Field. Great job to our math league team for being the most improved in their division this season, scoring 10% more points than last year. Congratulations to Laura Liu, who was named MVP for Thomas and was selected to the Monroe County State Team. 
Our Lote Department, language other than English, inducted 85 juniors and seniors into the Lote National Honor Society on March 5th. It's hard to believe that there are only two weeks left of classes in our third marking quarter, and we are lucky to have a spring break in between them. Thank you. Can I answer any questions? can you actually think we've had good weather yeah <laughs> so good for you we can see grass excellent I love that optimism <laughs> all right let's hear from Maria good evening board members the weather has finally started to warm up and our <laughs> and our spring no reflection on <laughs> um, although we love practicing in the gym we are thankful that our turf is finally cleared from all the snow and ready to play on it our AP Biology teacher, Mrs. DeGravio, and our student, Kyle Higgs, who's a senior at Schrader, were selected as a finalist to speak at in Allendale, Columbia's annual TEDx Talks. The selection process was extensive, and several Schrader students submitted applications. There were a total of 10 speakers chosen from the Rochester area. The event was held this past Saturday, and both Mrs. DeGravio and Kyle delivered their spark to a crowd of 100 people. TEDx events follow TED, TED rules, and therefore, those wishing to view the event had to apply. This year's topic and, topics and ideas worth spreading were centered around creating sparks. Mrs. Zagravio said, I have given several presentations in my life, but this one, wow, it was insane. Kyle's presentation was flawless, and I was very proud of him. Congratulations to both of them. A huge congratulations goes out to our Odyssey of the Mind team, made up of Holly Croft, Jay Croft, Colleen Miller, and Courtney Miller for winning second place on regionals on Saturday and will be going on to the state competition. Yesterday, our wind ensemble performed in the auditorium third period for all the fifth graders from our side of the district. This was a very fun way to show them what they could be doing and, how they could, and the potential they have in the big high school. Another incredible event that happened yesterday was Shilin Zhao performing on the Live from Hochstein broadcast, which is broadcasted at WXXI uh, Nine, or 91.5 or at interactive.wxxi.org slash listen. The program aired from 1210 to 1250 p.m. Shaleen plays in the Clarinet Wind Ensemble Orchestra and is a Hochstein Merit Scholarship winner. We hope you get a chance to listen to her play her wonderful music. Thank you, and I'm going to answer any questions. I'll just say I heard the concert yesterday. How was it? Oh, she was amazing. And Betty, Peggy, Peggy Quackenbush, who was her teacher, mm -hmm. also taught my daughter many, many years ago, and is just a superb teacher. So congratulations to her. It was, was a great concert. Loved it. <laughs> Thank you, girls. I do not see uh, the PTSA in the audience, so we'll move on to WTA and it's my understanding that Lisa is giving up her time tonight to a group of high school teachers. That's a group. <laughs> and I'm a teacher at Webster Thomas and I'm here on behalf of the Webster teachers. We as Webster district teachers would like to publicly thank our superintendent Carm Gamina, the Webster school board and its president Mike Cefaletto, um, the Webster Educational Leadership Association and its president um, Glenn Weedor, and the Webster PTSA and its co-chairs Chris Canenza and Denise Bellavina for reaching out to our legislators to oppose Governor Cuomo's planned changes to education in New York State and in the Webster Central Schools. As teachers, we greatly appreciate all the effort and resources that you have put forth in order to ensure that Webster schools maintain their excellence. Thank you for supporting and promoting these initiatives across the district. And as a Webster parent, I want to thank you also for keeping our kids in the equation because they're the most important part. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll move on now. Strategic planning is the process of looking at all the aspects of your school and planning how you wish to move the school forward. It provides the big picture of where you are, where you are going, and how you are going to get there. So I believe Brian would, is it Brian or Carm? Carm's gonna update us also? All right, well. Shall I come in? I was making the assumption that Brian was going to lead. The, are you leading? All right, then you, All three of us. you, can, you can start the process <laughs> if you are the person that is going to start the process. Actually, I'm going to defer over to our superintendent. Oh. Mr. Gavina is going to start the, the This first was your couple one slides. chance to. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thanks. And uh, so we'd like to give you a very brief, about 10 minute overview on our strategic plan. Um, and the, the full report will be coming in June. So for approximately uh, a year, we have been working on uh, our strategic plan for the Webster School District, and the core team includes uh, Sue and Ann and Paul from the board, myself and Brian and Shelley, as well as Glenn Weedor, Brian Zimmer, and Larry Wall. And the large team membership um, includes a whole bunch of people. <laughs> As you can see, there are approximately 40 um, members of staff, um, teachers, as well as administrators. Um, again, there's the core team as well, um, as well as some of our directors and parents. And uh, there's a nice cross-section of teachers from elementary, middle, and high school. Um, and there is a nice cross-section of parents as well, representing all three levels. Um, of our district um, and uh, it has been we again we have met over the last 15 months I think has it been about 15 months 15 16 months I think so the timeline <clears throat> we actually started in October of 2013 um, and there was a, the strategic survey and um, from the strategic survey uh, that led us to a meeting 14 months ago in January of 14 where we looked at possible work we discussed committees we broke up into committees we updated the um, and, and over the last 14 months we've been meeting in large with a large committee the core group as well as subcommittees um, and you'll be hearing about subcommittees in, in a moment and so right now we're up to March of 2015 and uh, in June of 15 we'll uh, we'll show you a final report and I don't like to use the term final because we have a feeling that the pre that the um, the update the strategic plan will be dynamic it'll be a living uh, document and we'll be updating the board um, probably I would imagine once a year or certainly every every year and a half okay so why um, why do this other than Sue said so um, this is uh, this has been something that I think so all of boy. us have been um, really eager to uh, uh, to get uh, to get underway, and I think um, certainly through Sue's leadership with this, um, it, it really started to happen again 14 or 15 months ago, um, and I know Anne has been certainly instrumental as well as Paul. So as a district, we really wanted to to delve into college career and community, uh, community readiness. What does that really mean? Um, and we also want to make sure that when we do a program review, does our program, our academic program, get our kids ready for uh, career, college, and community uh, readiness? So when we think of um, college, career, and community, um, as you can see, in the blue in the, in, on that slide really won't change over the next three slides, but um, we are definitely committed to making sure that our kids, our students, are college, career, and community ready. So we want to make sure that we offer a rigorous and comprehensive curriculum um, and that we also give them the skills, the essential skills, which you'll hear us talk about. Shelley, actually, we'll talk about that in a moment, um, to persevere, 
to deal sometimes with the obstacles and the failures that sometimes happen, that oftentimes happen. Um, and no matter what, though, it's to prosper so that they can still be college, uh, career, and community ready. So we want to also make sure that we have a program that allows our students to um, explore and um, prepare for a variety of, of, uh, of choices for careers um, when, they leave, when they leave us after 12th grade. As you guys know, the, the days of having only one job from the time that you're 22 to the time that you're 62 are basically over. I mean, uh, a typical college graduate or a typical high school graduate will have does, a dozen jobs or more by the time they retire. So we want to make sure that um, not only do we have a traditional career exploration, um, but that we also look at the non-traditional types of partnerships that our kids and uh, us as a faculty and staff and community can explore. And then lastly, um, we have spent many committee minutes as well as full, uh, whether it's full committee or the core or subcommittees, um, talking about those essential skills um, that are truly, they may be, they may not have anything to do with academics in the sense of like math content or, or such, but they are those essential skills um, that help our kids prepare for and be successful with service opportunities, with clubs, with sports, um, and the initiatives that we have as a district, especially the CARE initiative, um, those are the types of skills that our kids truly, that's what we want them to have when, uh, when they leave us because they will be ready for anything. They, that will really help them become community college and career ready. All right, and I'll pick up from here. Um, as Carm said, this has actually been a, a great journey. It's been a lot of fun actually, energizing, and uh, I think it's the sign of a truly an outstanding district is a district that has a strategic plan, that has this vision and mission that we can actually all get behind and incorporate all of our work. So one of the things that we ended the year last year with is we had wrestled with that definition of what is career, college, and community ready, and that's what Carmen was just talking about. And then the jumping off point for us this fall was, okay, now let's look at three different subcommittees that we want to break into. And so for our work to go forward this year, that's what we did. And the three that you see on the screen are the metrics, the essential skills, and certainly our programs. We wanted to do a, a cursory pro program review, like an overview of our program to get us kind of grounded in what it is that we take pride in and what are some other things that other school districts might take pride in as well. So I'm going to talk about first the metrics subgroup. So we broke up um, and we began to think about what are those <coughs> metrics that we want to measure our school district by so that we know that our graduates are leaving us in such a, in, in a good place. And certainly we have the academic ones and we've looked at those before, but to us as this process evolved, it became, became more and more apparent to everybody on the large committee and certainly those on the subcommittees as well that we needed to make sure that we were benchmarking ourselves against our care behaviors is something we've all been living with, but also as Shelley's gonna talk about those essential skills. That is something that has been really a lot of fun and like we talk about energetic. I mean, it really, it breathes energy into our programs when we can talk about those essential skills that our kids are going to need when they leave us. So those are some of the pieces that, uh, um, that the metrics will talk about, both qualitative and quantitative. We're going to take some of our survey data and we're going to talk about how often we're going to do that survey so we can, we, we can continue <coughs> to look at that. And if we look at it, the qualitative data and what perceptions kids might have of their own career, we can really gleam a lot from asking students questions. And that's something that certainly has gotten us excited as well. And now I'm going to turn things over to Shelley, who will talk to us a little bit about these essential skills. When we started our work um, and we continued um, to really ask ourselves, how do we want to move forward with the work and what are we going to focus on? And <clears throat> at every meeting, we would continue to come back to the soft skills. And as a group, we identified and determined that we really didn't like the term soft skills because it really didn't provide or elevate uh, the ne necessity and the need for the skills that our students need to have when they leave here. It's not only when they leave here. These skills are essential to have to be able to be good quality learners um, and then to take that to the next step. 
Um, as a team, we really focused on the research. There's so much research out there that now supports the need for public education to incorporate these skills into the work that we're doing. And as a committee, we landed on these six skills, perseverance, collaboration, integrity, time management, self-management, and communication. As um, Carmen, both Brian have said, the work that we have already in place with our, our PBIS work and our, the focus on care, it really complements this work because that's more of a broader system focus on what do we expect from our students. This work now is really gonna focus on what do we want for the individual student and how can every person in this environment um, understand what my role is and making sure that our kids have these skills, are learning these skills, that we can model these skills. So we are now thinking about and talking about how are we going to implement this work? And you know, I think we're all feeling excited because we so believe in, in this work and the essential skills and the importance of our students having it. Um, yeah. So we'll talk a little bit more about the impl implementation. Yeah, and you'll see more about that in June. Um, as far as the K-12 program review, we wanted, like I said, to really get a broad sense. So one of the things that we decided to do as a subcommittee, another subcommittee, and Ann was sitting on this subcommittee with us, um, was we said, let's take a look at some websites and specifically some course offering booklets um, from about 22 different schools from the area, <coughs> some from the state, some other places in the state, and a couple of them actually nationally. And it was a neat opportunity for us. We, we came up with as a group 10 different look fors or 10 different questions and said, let's go and start to look into what are some programs that are in some other school districts and what are some things that we could be looking for in the future, so to speak. And it generated a lot of thought, a lot of questions, and certainly some recommendations that we're going to be looking for uh, as we go forward. <laughs> and certainly we want to make sure that, as the first bullet point on this slide says, is do they align? to what our desired outcomes are. So a few of the nitpick, or a few of the details of that certainly are, um, we're gonna look at potentially more offerings online or what can we get out of an online course um, that is something that I know all school districts are looking at right now. Rotational schedule. Can we offer more courses by rotating them and not having them every, offering them every single year in a situation where then our staffing wouldn't necessarily need to go up and skyrocket? Um, or can we use some creative scheduling? Can we work with our teachers and work with our teachers union to say we might be able to offer a little bit more if we flex some of our, of our time, either a little bit earlier in the day and allow some travel time or even potentially a little bit after school. So those are some of the things that we wanna at least investigate you know, and see where we can go from there. But I think the, hopefully the excitement and the energy out of the, the strategic planning committee is hopefully coming through and if we're not doing a good job with that, you'll see that in June because they certainly are uh, an exciting group. So, We still have more work ahead of us. Um, so from now until June, we are gonna continue to work in our subgroups um, so that we can finalize the metrics. Um, there's still some work to be done around, around that um, as we look at how do we wanna define um, our district and what's gonna be helpful for all of us to be able to measure um, our success. Um, developing that implementation plan for the essential skills. Um, what truly is it gonna mean for every individual here in the district? And I think that's what we wanna continue to focus on. It isn't just um, teachers, it's not just our support staff, it's every uh, adult um, that's gonna be interfacing with our students here. Um, the communication plan um, for staff in the community around the strategic plan. How can they understand what it is and how can they support it? They need to understand that so that then they can see themselves in supporting this. And then it is determining that schedule. Um, how, are you, how are we, how are you going to um, identify um, what was that schedule going to look like so that then we as a district can help to bring you that information in a meaningful way. And lastly, when we talk about bringing you that information um, so that we can have those meaningful discussions on a regular basis, um, it's a matter of also determining okay, what needs to be reviewed and then how often. So <coughs> this last slide talks about, okay, we need to develop a review cycle for, for these strategic planning initiatives, whether it's academic, fa facilities enrollment, financial, family engagement, but many of them may not need to be reviewed at the same uh, frequency as the others. 
So that's one of the future things that we as a strategic planning team need to, need to discuss and bring, uh, bring to the full board. Um, and uh, I think one of the goals is to have that for you, have that type of uh, review plan ready for you uh, by June. Questions? Start with you, Tom. <coughs> Initial update here for us, um, and I was glad to see that last slide in particular. Um, we need to, as you said, review and primarily the academics, putting that up against what the student needs to be successful in career college or community, mm -hmm. and what we may have today, and we're comfortable teaching and very good teaching, may not be relevant, right. and we need to be able to step away from that right. and. Um, go for something that has more relevance. Right. Thank you. Great point. Good. Mike? Good report. Uh, no questions at this time. And you're okay? Yes, just one thing um, at the end. I, I just want people to be aware that if you've not participated previously on a, on a committee, but something piques your interest and you'd like to participate, it's not too late to join us, correct? Yeah, right. And so that will be available on our website, that type of information, or certainly any one of us could be contacted if there's something that jumps out at you that you would like to be a part of. Thanks, Ann. And staff. Mike. I'll piggyback on that. I, I love strategic planning and, and enjoy the process and various uh, opportunities I've had to be a part. So I thank you for this presentation. As you know, I'm new to this, and this is the first <laughs> glance I'm seeing at this. And I, uh, I was excited by some of the slides and the feedback and ideas that are forthcoming. So I look forward to hear what you have in June. Great. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. Paul. Ooh, I just, just a couple of comments. I've had to step out the last couple of meetings, so I've kind of missed out a little bit, and I'm excited to get back into it. But, um, you know, the board members driving it and administrators kind of have to be there in some ways. But I was, I'm always so impressed with the community members slash parents and the teachers and what they brought to the table, too, along with that collaborative group. And it's really, it was really astounding and amazing, um, the openness of sharing ideas and thoughts from where we started to where this is now is a testament to the whole group community uh, working together. So it's nice to see that. Yeah. It was good. Sue? I don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> I also, uh, well, she's the, the bully of the, I guess, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm the bully now. Yeah, because you're definitely not a teddy bear. <laughs> Well, I also, as the rest of the board, is, am excited to hear what you have to say in June. And this is a much different process than what I think we started off with way back in whatever it was, 2013. So thank you very much. Uh, this is for information only, so we don't need any action on this at all. And we'll, we'll give Carmen a few seconds to get back here because his report will be next. Thank you, Mike. So I'd like to begin my report this evening with a report on a memorable field trip for a group of Webster students. And you can see up on the screen, first year adaptive PE teacher Kara Carpenter, along with PE teacher Rob Purcell, organized an outing to the Webster Ice Arena for two classes of second through fifth graders from Schlegel Road and DeWitt Road. Both of these classes focus on life skills, for our, for our special ed students, and Kara thought it was important that our students get some physical activity out in the community. So the kids enjoyed a morning of ice skating at the Webster Ice Arena, and as you can probably tell from these pictures, it was a huge success. Thanks to the group of special education teachers and paraprofessionals from Schlegel and DeWitt, including Nicole Hilfiger and Jan Hackett, who accompanied the kids, worked with them one-on-one -on -one to teach them how to skate, and joined in the fun. Thanks to the Webster Ice Arena, who supplied these beginning skaters with walkers to get them acclimated to the ice. And after skating, the kids got to enjoy Charlie's for lunch. 
using communication skills to place their own orders and good manners at the table while sharing a meal together. Kara hopes to organize at least one more field trip before the end of the school year. It's a job well done on a field trip that emphasized life skills for our students and actually essential skills. Right, Miss Casey? Those are some pretty essential skills that they're doing. Yep. <coughs> so second piece of my report, I'd like to acknowledge two administrators who play an important role in our school district, one of whom shares the dais with us tonight. Paul Benz has been named Region 11's Principal of the Year by the SANE School Administrators Association of New York, which is also called the George Zito Award. Webster is fortunate to have Paul's leadership and expertise as a member of our Board of Education, and he is a principal at North Rose Wolcott High School, and Paul has transformed that high school. So congratulations, Mr. Benz. Also, Webster's Director of Fine Arts, Dr. Johanna Siebert, has also been named Director of the Year by Region 11 um, from, the school, from the School Administrators Association of New York. And our students and teachers certainly appreciate Dr. Siebert's championing of our music and fine arts programs. Her dedication and passion for the arts is, is evident in all that she does. The acknowledgement of her leadership is well-deserved. Congratulations to Dr. Siebert. Webster, speaking of music and Dr. Siebert, Webster also celebrates Music in Our Schools Month and Youth Art Month throughout the month of March. And we received some exciting news just 24 hours ago um, to kick off this portion of my report. For the 10th time, Webster has been named one of the 2015 Best Communities for Music Education by the NAMM Foundation, National Association for Music, and I'm not sure what the other M is. Um, I can't remember. While the award is given for several re re reasons, it is a testament to our district's continued commitment to providing a well-rounded music education for our students, an education that is enthusiastically supported by the Webster community. That community support makes the celebration of this award a reality year after year, and congratulations to our community, our moms and dads and students and teachers, um, and uh, our administrators too as well um, because without their support this doesn't happen. So I'm sure many of you have already experienced the outstanding musicals offered at our middle schools over the last few weeks. It's the National Association <coughs> of Music Merchants. Nas National Association of Music Merchants. Wow, okay, that's right. So and we are again the best, one of the best communities according to them. <laughs> so the outstanding musicals offered at middle schools just over the last few weeks. Spry just performed Susical Jr. just last weekend, and Willink performed Peter Pan Jr. last month. Webster Thomas is getting ready to break a leg with Sweet Charity that begins tonight. Actually, it's happening right now. They just opened up seven minutes ago um, and running through Saturday evening, while Schrader wrapped up Guys and Dolls just a few weeks ago. In addition to the countless music concerts performed by our student musicians throughout the month of March, 141 of our kids have been performing in all county ensembles at every level, elementary, junior high, senior high, and jazz. We also had 41 students receive Scholastic Art Awards. And you wonder why Webster is the envy of so many other districts for our, our music and our art programs. To top that off, we just found out a few hours ago like around four o'clock, that two of our Webster Schrader musicians earned awards as a result of last weekend's Young Artist aud Auditions, sponsored by the Rochester Philharmonic League. Senior violinist Helen Wong was co-winner of the Aldridge Tinker $1,000 Instrumental Scholarship and the Ruth and Sidney Salzman $500 Award for Strings. And senior baritone, David Wentling was a runner-up for the Nobel Hirsch Award for Male Vocalists. Both will perform at the Kilbourne Hall at the Eastman School of Music during the YAA recital in July. I continue to be amazed by a student's ability to reach all of us through their music and art. Thank you to all of the music and art teachers who instill this great love of music and arts and fine arts in our students and for the students who have been honored for their participation in our outstanding programs. Okay, last piece. Actually, no, two more pieces. 
we got a lot of congratulations and celebrations tonight. I wanted to do a quick update and congratulations on some news I reported to you back in September. The National Merit Scholarship Program has now determined which of the 16,000 semifinalists have met the requirements to advance to the finals in that prestigious scholastic competition. I am proud to share that Webster has seven seniors moving on to the finalist. Congratulations to Laura Liu from Webster Thomas, and congratulations to these six Schrader students, Michael Incardona, Maria Kowalchuk, Julia Wiseman, Peter Wood, Kyle Zhao, and Christopher Yi. There will be $8,000, sorry, there will be 8,000 scholarships awarded throughout this month. We wish all of our Webster finalists the best. And lastly, I'd like to thank our community members, faculty, and staff for sending more than 2,500 letters, and that's a very conservative number, to New York State lawmakers advocating for change in the budget process. It's important that our stakeholders' voices continue to be heard. If you'd like more information on how you can reach out to state lawmakers, please visit our advocacy quick link found on the left-hand side of our website. Also, as a reminder, you can let your voice be heard by voting on Webster's budget vote and election coming up on Tuesday, May 19th, 6 to 9 p.m. at the Webster Schrader Gymnasium. That ends my report. Just a thought, Carm. In our gyms, we have banners all over the place about all our athletic endeavors. Do we have any place where we have our music endeavors or our other scholastic places hanging? I don't think we do. And I think we can rectify that this month. That's right. <laughs> great idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. Mr. Freeman, remind me of that tomorrow, would you? I'm going to forget it. I'm going to forget. Of course, we could always, we could always mark. <laughs> <laughs> we could always mark, too, on our athletic endeavors, all those teams that are scholastic winners. That's right. And that would be all of them <laughs> for every season. that would be fantastic. Thank, well, thank you. you for your report, Carm. We'll move on to new business for the board. And we have a resolution before us establishing the hours of the budget vote, which is May uh, 19th. It, the resolution is asking that we establish the hours from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. in the Schrader Gymnasium. May we have a second to that resolution, please? Thank you. Is there any discussion on this resolution? Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor of this resolution? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we also have a resolution in front of us for the purchase of school buses. Now I'd like to point out that the buses purchased will come with this enhanced camera system and a tracking system for safety and security concerns. The buses also will be coming with additional storage which will allow us to more efficiently carry teams and groups to their locations. Uh, it's also important to note that all purchases are eligible for state aid. So with that being an introduction, may we have a second to this resolution? So moved. Thank you. This does require a roll call vote. So Cindy, would you please take the roll? The oh. the okay. The That's all dependent on the passage of, of the resolution referendum um, at the vote on the 19th of May. So this is kind of a pre-order. Correct. <clears throat> We're hoping to purchase. It's a, to uh, a total of 13, 13. 13 buses. Okay. Does that need to be actually worded in the resolution? It is. Um, it's not in the resolution. All replacement. I don't see that in here. So. Just the dollar amount. So we could just amend the resolution to re if, if indeed you are required. Well, it, we're required to list it on the proposition that goes okay. before the voters. So specifically, not for this, what are, this particular not for this, vote. Not for this particular okay. vote. I just wanted to know how many we were looking to purchase. I thought it, it was included in the backup That's documentation. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any other discussion? So that's how the companies 
just to, right. to piggy bank. That's how the companies, you, you do like a pre-order, and they understand. Correct, with the understanding um, that, that it's dependent on the passage of the proposition. And that but they can get everything all set up correct. and be prepared so that when you do they, it. They know how many frames to uh, right. set up for uh, fitting. And then so that they can deliver them by September by 1 September or, 1, yes. or whenever we need them. Great. Okay, we all set? Yeah. Are you set, Mike? Okay, Cindy, call the roll. Okay, Paul? Uh, yes. Dan? Yes. Sue? Yes. Mike Deedy? Yes. Mike Dustin? Yes. Huh? Yes. Mike Stockwell? Yes. Okay. Okay, that carries. Brian, would you like to highlight anything in the Treasurer's Report? Uh, just. Just a couple items. Uh, month of January, I want to point out uh, our STAR payment came in. So our entire uh, $12.9 million of STAR uh, arrived in the month of January. So you'll notice that change uh, between the two, two months uh, from January to December. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we had um, our Medicaid claims come in. I guess the best way to describe it would be clumps uh, when, they decide, when they get processed. Um, so we had a, a large chunk of Medicaid come in as well as January. And um, overall, I just want to point out that those two things helped us uh, really improve our cash flow for the month of January, uh, which is a low state aid month. We, don't, we do not receive a lot of state aid in the month of January, but we actually uh, have improved our cash flow position by over $2 million uh, for the month of January uh, because the star showed up um, and our revenues outpaced our disbursements for that month. So those were the only things I really wanted to highlight for you tonight, unless there is additional questions or areas I may be wrong in my timing but I recall from your last report at our first budget session that there are substantial changes or significant changes in the star program uh, I guess it was at budget advisory yes. that you shared that and one of the changes is should you move from your current home and purchase a new home you are not eligible for that star Correct. That's on the table currently. As it's only part on of, the table then. So that it's a possibility if okay. it goes through with the budget. But it's so it won't impact our budget projection for revenues for next year. Correct. Okay. Just that is something people I think are not aware of. And right. okay. We'll go into uh, much greater yes. detail okay. about that next Thursday. Thank you. So I'm premature on that. Thank you. Other questions for Brian? If not, may we have a motion, please, to accept the treasurer's report for January. So moved. Thank you. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we do have some small changes in wording on three policies related to employment and employees. Sue, do, would you care to highlight any of these changes? Sure. Okay, the first one, 3114, employment of related individuals. Basically, just wanted to correct um, the title of our HR person to reflect what we use now as opposed to what we were using from Chief Human Resource Officer to Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. Can we take these all as one, or do you want to do each one individually? These are all first readings. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the second. Policy, uh, employee commercial activities, 3160. Uh, we recommend eliminating the second line. District employees are not to engage in advertising or commercial solicitation on school time. Period. Period. That's what we'd like to change it to. Anybody have any comments? Questions about that? I'm sorry, what was that? Break rooms is that break rooms and for rooms personal time? I mean, what's that including? On school time. School time. So it's within the school day. So it can be on property, it just can't be during school time. On school time. I don't so know, you know, if a lunch period, uh, that would be a is clarifying. Is a lunch, it's, so con okay. All right. So uh, this would be, let's say, because I'm still getting I'm getting paid for that seven hour block of time by the district and um, so I am not 
to engage in advertising or commercial solicitations on school time. So I can't advertise during that. That's during how that business period. cards talk yeah. about work. Right. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, did you get that? Did you understand? Well, well I understand that. But it can go as small as Mary Kay Cosmetics or anything like that too, correct? Correct. So that means no, no solicitation. More booklets in the break room. You cannot so catalog in the break room. Right. If it's fu if fund, yeah. I mean, technically, that is true. If you're if well, you're the you employee, can just leave them there. Right. And then somebody looks but at you them. Can. Is that solicitation? Or? I don't think leaving a book there. I think it's. Yeah. Uh, I think the spirit of it was, right. you know, I, 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 I shouldn't be going to your door and <laughs> yeah. with or Mary Kay. with Mar district yeah. phones and Correct. computers. Yeah. I right. think maybe that's yeah. a bigger part of it, perhaps. Yeah. But, okay. We just need to spell that out all? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think we need well, that's the question. I, uh, I think I would look to an attorney for would it, help. I don't know. Could, yeah. spell out. I think there needs to be more to it. I think that needs to be greater clarity. Take, well, take, the way that it was before isn't out. really right. that clear either. Correct. Right. <laughs> we can always ask the policy committee to go back and relook at this. Sure. Yeah. We can do that. Sure. And we can, um, run where's Brian? Mike Dodd. Mike Dodd. We'll run yeah. it by Mike Dodd, see what, um, get some examples of other district right. ones. Because we need consistency. That's 3160. Okay. Consistent. Sounds good. Okay. And then the last one um, is the. District cell phone policy, 4170. Is that the one you just numbered, Cindy? Uh, I, don't so. I don't think so either. This one was here before. Yeah. Yeah, this one was here before. But we just wanted to um, clean up the policy and eliminate the use of PDAs because we don't use PDAs anymore. We got rid of cost, I think. We changed the cost. Yes. Any questions? Comments? No. Okay. So, then go ahead. I'm sorry. Do we? We don't need a motion. You just accept the first. All right. Reading. So we'll we'll move the first and third, the thirty-one fourteen and the forty-one seventy for a second read at our next meeting. And we will put 3160 on our agenda for our next policy meeting in May. Okay. Can everybody agree with that? Yep. Is that okay? And that works. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Great. Good. Okay. Excellent. Now we'll t move on. We're going to take a second look at the proposed school calendar for next year. It should be noted that each district is required by New York State to have a minimum of 180 days of instruction and that each school district can add days as they negotiate with their various units. Contractually, we have obligations with a minimum number of instructional days, professional development days for our staff, parent conference days, regent and standardized test dates, as well as accommodating holidays. We usually start with the last regent's exam and work our way backwards using the BOCES calendar as a guide. And that gives us our particular calendar that we're looking at for our second read. So, Carm, is there anything that you care to highlight or add to our understanding of this calendar? Actually, Mike, I think uh, you hit the high points. It is incredibly important that, um, as a district, you try to stay within the constructs of the BOCES calendar. Um, and both BOCES 1 and BOCES 2 um, have calendars. Obviously, we, we follow, we have some kids that go to BOCES 2 for some programs. We also have many, many students that go to BOCES 1 for, the, for programs as well. And um, so to deviate from that calendar, it, is, it puts, like to say to ourselves, we're gonna get rid of February break. Just, and just do it alone without any other district following. It's really tough to do that because, you know, we'd, our kids would be in school while everybody else would be closed and there are programs that would no longer, would, that would not be running during that week and it would uh, cause some hardships. So um, the BOCES calendar does start class before Labor Day and um, does maintain that we have a Wednesday before Thanksgiving off that we do not work, sorry, that kids are not in class um, 
on December 23rd, and that we also have a full February uh, break next year, um, and that we still have uh, an Easter, or a, yeah, actually Easter is very early again next year, but we also have Good Friday off. So with those things in mind, uh, my recommendation to the board during the second reading is to um, accept and to approve this school calendar for next year. Any questions? An observation. Will we, following tonight's vote, put a notice on our website as a notice just to alert parents yep. that for some might be a surprise? Yeah. So um, what we've done in the past, Anne, is we have, as soon as this is done, um, Cindy, tomorrow we'll post it on our website, Facebook. Facebook. I'll tweet it. We'll also send it to all tonight. Okay. We'll send it to all principals, right, and they will newsletter. they'll right. e-blast it as well. Perfect. Thank you. The thought just occurred to me about busing, because we do provide busing for kids in uh, private and parochial schools, and if we're not in the same calendar as there they are, it makes it a little difficult. It does. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, that's not, not appropriate. Got it. Yep. Let's not start that. So, so I think this requires what action. Does, we okay. have to have action. Okay. I'm just mm -hmm. letting people have the opportunity to ask questions. So what day is graduation? Well, graduation. Yeah. graduation next year. Sunday. Right now will be Jan or June, <laughs> June 26th. All right, may we have a motion please to accept the proposed calendar? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, we'll move on to our school liaison reports. Paul, we'll start with you. Do you have anything to? I do not. I'm going to pass. Okay. Uh, I'll move over to Mike. Do you have anything? Mike D? No. no, no. Nope. Ann? Yes, I do. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Plank South and Clem North PTSAs. And as you know, uh, Plank South meetings always begin with fifth graders reporting, and I love it. They just always have good stuff to share. And one of the things I thought was particularly endearing, if nothing else, was their kudos to a kindergarten student who decided instead of accepting birthday party presents, he asked for donations for the Plank South, South Playground. How cool is that? That's great. And that action resulted in $400 to be donated That's to the great. Plank South Kindergarten. It was in the Webster Herald, but I just thought it was so cool. Good for this young man. So that was really, really cool. They're also working very hard um, at trying to find reasonable fundraising events that don't keep putting burdens on families and the community. And I really appreciated the fine line and the struggle that they recognize. So I really love going to these meetings because you learn so much and you get you have such admiration for the works that are there. Uh, their science fair is next week on the 26th. It's one of our long longer standing science fairs. And also they celebrate their 10th anniversary for Jump for Heart and they've been one of the highest earning school, I mean thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars during this time frame. And in fact, I think they were recognized one year as being one of the top three in the state. Clem North is equally inspiring to me. They, they always have good conversation. Um, one of the things they shared, and I believe all of the schools are doing this, but there it is an effort to um, improve family engagement and they did send out uh, volunteer surveys for to their staff parents are looking for ways to um, engage and also provide help and so they were looking again these surveys have been completed they're tabulating the results so the parents are eager to know what they can do to help in their classrooms their open house was on the 3rd of March, and on the 13th, they celebrated their winter carnival. And on <coughs> March 20th, I believe, is, um, oh, I'm sorry, no, that, that was something, a parent-teacher conference, but that's for everybody. So they also announced a number of wonderful assemblies that will come to the 
uh, Clem North community during the month of May. The one other thing, if I can indulge for one more minute, Plank South also, as did Clem North, they did talk about the advocacy efforts. They appreciated the efforts that um, the district has made. They also all encouraged the letter writing and so forth. But one of the uh, documents that was shared, I really liked the, the language that was used, and it was information brought from the New York State PTA, and I just want to read a couple of lines because I do think they're valuable. They agree, and it, it is in response to the governor's uh, um, attempt to tie even more testing to the um, to the evaluation process, and they just say that they recognize student assessment is valid and a valuable aspect of instruction. But recent experience has led us, meaning New York State PTA Executive Board, to conclude that directly linking standardized student test scores to individual teaching performance ratings has damaged the professional evaluation system and the quality of instruction it was designed to improve. And I just thought I liked that language, that it recognized it's damaging the system, not just the results. And I thought that was one distinction we don't hear often. So I just wanted to call attention to that. Thank PTA for its um, efforts and research into this and then sharing their voice. So thank you. I know I took longer than I should have. But. Thank you, Ann. Mike? Tom? Quick. Uh, State Road had their uh, most recent PTSA meeting this past Monday, fairly well attended. Uh, we're wrapping up some of the uh, uh, different activities they had for fundraising. Uh, there was an anonymous gift made uh, from a retiring staff member um, for uh, $1,000 to the uh, playground renovation. Uh, and uh, just a very, very good meeting. Thank you, Tom. Sue? Um. I had the opportunity to go to the Schlegel Road PTSA meeting on March 10th, oh, another well-attended meeting. Agenda items included the Mother's Son Breakfast, as well as Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, including f uh, as well as fundraising. Also, they talked about advocacy, and, and um, you know they had a letter there, a sample letter that people could fill out and such. They also had a presentation by the librarian, Sandra Huey, about OPAC, which is O-P-A-C, and it stands for Online Patron Access, and it's a tool for student and parents to, um, to use um, for the library, for taking up books and keeping track of what books you have and when, they're, um, when they need to be returned, as well as when you, you, know, you can order books from other libraries, and, and there is a mechanism in place to have deliveries and stuff, so that was pretty cool. And their next meeting is May 12th. Thank you, Sue. On Tuesday, Surprise PTSA had Coco with the principal. Uh, Dave Swinson spoke to and clarified any questions parents had in regards to the opt-out process uh, for the New York State assessments. Various activities were discussed, and they're still looking for some volunteers to provide baked goods for their listening post dates, which are in April and May. And I'd also like to congratulate both the faculties from Spry and Willink for a very successful benefit basketball game uh, they had earlier um, in February. Also, the PTSA at Plank North met yesterday, and they also heard about uh, the uh, opt-out uh, procedures, as well as math acceleration options at the middle school, and uh, regard, um, the input that parents had in regard to student placement. Uh, they do have some uh, upcoming events, including Staff Appreciation Week, a spring plant sale, and an ice cream social that is uh, they're looking forward to. I would just quickly like to go over our calendar. On Tuesday, March 24th, I know both Ann and myself have signed up for coffee with the principal at Willink. Uh, on Wednesday, I know I will be able to go to the uh, YEA investors panel. I don't know if anyone else, okay. What day is that? That, that is Wednesday, March 25th. It six. is at six o'clock here in the Spry Auditorium. So you're not going to the president's meeting? No, okay. I had already I'll committed. I already okay. committed to this one. Um, okay. There's also a PTSA from Clem South. Paul, are, yeah. are, you, are you able to go to that? What's the date on that one? I thought it was the 25th. Uh, I'm not going to be able to make it. 
But, wait a minute. I could be wrong on that. Uh, I had it on my calendar, but um, that's all right. Yeah. Hang on, Cindy sent the calendar today. It's right here. Oh, I have it right here too. It's it's not on there. So it's it's on the um, PTSA calendar. All right, we have the break oh, then on Monday. It is there. Okay. It's just the way that okay. the page well, broke. Okay. So can anybody cover that plank south, or I'm sorry, it's Clem south. south. And All right. We'll we'll have to see what happens on that one. Okay. Uh, then on the um, well. I don't think anyone here can cover the science fair because we have a board of education meeting, so we just won't be able to cover Plain South's science fair. We then have the break and we come back on uh, the 6th of April. We have WTA Executive Board. I know uh, Sue and myself mm -hmm. are scheduled for that. We have to. I, I'd like to go. Okay, and then, all right. <laughs> we then on Tuesday, uh, Monday, April 6th. It's at 4.30. Uh, Tuesday, April 7th, we have SEPTA Community Fair. I'll go to that. Okay, Tom and, and Sue are definite for that. Uh, there's budget advisory. Mike, are you our budget advisory person? Yes. Okay, so you'll be going to that? Yep. All right. On Wednesday, April 8th, we have Clem North PTSA. Can, Mike, you want to? It's it. Yeah. Can, yeah, I can go to that. I'll, I'll just work it out who, uh, I'll also be attending on the uh, 8th, the Thomas National Honor Society okay. induction. So I'll, I'll go to that. Okay. Can you do when? Or yes. Okay, you'll do when on the 9th? Yep. And I know uh, on Community Arts Day, the 11th, I know yep. Carm is working, I'm working, I'm Tom's I'm already, working. I should be able to work yeah, for help. Okay. That's Saturday the 11th. There's a sign up genius that you can. Yeah, I think the three of us are. Oh my gosh, people. <laughs> a lot of sausage. <laughs> what do you want, a tiny sausage? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you She's very so much, proud. people. <laughs> All right, we'll move into our Monroe County School Boards Association. Sue, do you uh, want to mention anything on steering? Uh, we have our meeting next Wednesday. Um, as you may all know, Jody Siegel is retiring as of July 15th. So the executive board of Monroe County School Board is handling the search <coughs> process. Um, the job has been posted and at the president's meeting, which you won't be there, but I will. So if you have any input that you want to provide as to what qualities you're looking for, any suggestions you might have regarding um, what we're going to be looking for for a new executive director, please email me directly prior to that meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Tom, anything on the legislative? I was not able to attend. Sue, Sue do you want me to go? Yeah. Or? Okay, very good. Um, yes, we met at the legislative session. and. Um, a lot of the conversation was about the upcoming lobbying trip, which is going to be taking place on the 20. Thank you. And I am actually our, our board's representative to that session. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, just a couple of things from Jody's report. The, both the Senate and the Assembly have passed their one house budgets. And um, one thing that is helpful is Senator Nizzolio, who is our representative, has very key positions in, in the budget deliberation process. He is a member of the Joint Conference Committee, which is important, as well as the actual Budget Committee. So he is um, extremely influential, and we are appreciative of the Senator's efforts on school districts apart, as well as his other advocacy. A uh, couple of things, he, they have indicated the Senate's assembly plan has stated that the, um, well, first of all, they are calling for the elimination of the entire $1 billion left for the uh, gap elimination adjustment. So they're calling for the entire uh, elimination of that. They've also stated that one point one billion dollars is the absolute floor for state aid and that they're um, 
strong in advocates for that. These one these budgets have multiple issues. They probably have ten or twelve planks. Um, so anybody that is interested in all of the pieces, they just have to go on uh, Senator Nizzolio's website. He has it all spelled out, as does the Assembly have their budget laid out. A couple of things that the Senate has agreed to, though, is um, the lifting of the ceiling on charter schools, and that um, is a concern for uh, certainly many school districts, as well as their support for the investment education investment credit, which is somewhat unique from most tax credits. Usually a tax credit requires you to have a income minimum. This one does not. And people are able to deduct up to 75% of what turns out to be a $1.2 million donation. Now I'm not suggesting most people do that, but I'm unaware of any tax credit anywhere that allows that type of latitude. There's no income minimum, and if you think about what your child care deductibility is, I guarantee you it's not 75%. So that, that is an area of concern. The advocacy window is still open, and again, that's something I think it is important. However, I think <coughs> we're very appreciative of the Senate's effort to eliminate the um, GEA adjustment penalties and then also for adequate and fair funding for state um, public schools. The probably two most noteworthy issues regarding the Assembly's One House budget is an increase of $80 million for UPK funding, but then also to increase school aid to schools by $1.8 billion. So anyway, thanks to our representatives who are advocating for fair and appropriate funding. Thank you, Ian. Since our board members were unable to make the labor relations meeting, I believe Brian was good enough to substitute for us. Were you not? No. From Harris Beach, uh, presented on the APPR topic specifically relating to 3028, did a nice job of going through uh, quite a few different cases and whatnot. Um, it was it was interactive, like he gave a scenario and then we got to choose what would happen and it was neat. Uh, he did point out that uh, as far as 3020A and APPR goes, there has been zero cases so far that have been a situation where a teacher has been let go in the state due to ineffective rating twice and it's been followed through for that reason. Now, other 3020As have been filed for other reasons and certainly that's similar in nature. Um, so that was one piece that he had definitely uh, made a point to talk to us about. And then he talked to us about the Article 7 that uh, Ann was just referring to and 22 different points. So if you want to look at the 22 different points that he points out from that, I'm sure many of you know those as well. The one thing that uh, did come up that uh, to put on your radar is they're looking for topics for next year. And so now is kind of that window to be thinking about that and bring them back to the next labor relations uh, meeting so that they can go forward for next year. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. At Information Exchange, our topic was the kindergarten entrance age, which is five years old by December 1st, and how it affects uh, the readiness of children who must learn curriculum-based standards. Now, only five states do not mandate kindergarten, and New York is one of them. Uh, wonder why. And you know, we can get into that whole idea. <laughs> but an interesting uh, thing is to note is that the local, it's a local decision of the Board of Education to determine whether they would want to change the entrance age requirement for their kindergartners. And many districts are looking at the possibility of changing the cutoff date to make sure that the kindergarten students are five prior to the start of school. So that might be an interesting discussion for us to have in the near future. I did not realize that it was a local decision. That necessarily would entitle to someone who was held back to start the first grade, though. No. What would be the benefit? Yeah. First grade, it would be six by December 1st. The benefit would be, um, and one of the things we talked about was that the, right now, the Common Core curriculum for kindergartners, it really was designed with a five year old in mind. and. When you have a December 1st cutoff, and approximately, I'm trying to go back to my days as State Road principal, approximately 10 to 15% of our students would be, they'd be four years old when they started kindergarten. 
And I was four years old when I started kindergarten, and look what happened to me. So, um, <laughs> but the idea would be everyone would be five. Every single kindergartner that entered would be five years old, um, especially if you had an August 1st cutoff date. And, and then perhaps it would be, um, uh, the curriculum would then be more appropriate, I guess, for, for the kindergartners. And there's a maturity level yeah, too. There was, okay. Yeah, so th there was a school, there was a psychologist or psychiatrist there that talked about the number of behaviors that we're now seeing in kindergartners that perhaps it's because of the fact that, you know, they're four years old and the, the academic and curricular demands on them are a little bit much, okay. perhaps, um, in some cases. Does that apply then for first grade? Because first grade it would be, you need to be what, I think six by I the think first six grade. was the state. Six was the state mandate, yeah. So, so you could. Okay, yeah. but there is a possibility of kind of right. throwing things yeah. off a little bit right. doing that. Yes, so you have to do both. You have to move them back. Yeah. So, anyway. You okay. know, also, I, there was a trend maybe a decade ago that parents were very comfortable to making the decision to hold back right. a late summer or early fall birthday. And I spoke to a couple of um, superintendents that were at the table I was at and said have you noticed a change because it just seems to me that we have many more younger kids and they said there does seem to be the trend now that again because so many parents are working yeah. and it's such a good setting it's not like it's hurting right. their child but with the increased demands for first grade um, not just with Common Core, but what's been the increasing yeah. trend. So it's not just related to that one issue, that it is a more of a struggle. So that was an interesting conversation. Was there a one time a pre first yeah. there was. type Long program? Time ago. Long time 15 ago. 15 years ago, yeah. approximately. Okay, our executive committee was basically think the same thing that was hashed for our steering. You know, Jody is retiring. We're looking for a new executive. Uh, we'll move on to anything from the New York State School Board Association, Tom. Thank you very much. This past weekend, there was a board meeting uh, held in Albany. Uh, I attended uh, remotely through conference call. Um, some interesting things were shared. Again, a lot of discussion on the budget. Uh, some of the things that you heard about at the table tonight um, were probably gleaned from some of the data that came out of either um, New York State School Boards or the uh, superintendent's group which NISBA always passes down, both of those. Um, also, the 15th and 16th was the State Issues Conference. Um, I'm glad to report that there was a lot of folks from Area 2. Nobody from Monroe County went to that because their- That's because Monroe County- Their has trip a, is this week. The, mm -hmm. the, the importance, though, of it that I think um, was powerful is that they're going, they were going up to the floors on Monday and there was almost 350 people, just school board members, and they're not going on Tin Cup Tuesday, which you'll be going next, Tuesday will be on Tuesday. You'll be going you know, up there, and it's a whole bunch of different groups up there. Uh, my understanding is that the conferences held with the individual legislators that were in Albany lasted anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, not the 15 minutes you're gonna get next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So you, you go more in depth to explain something, they usually bring in their staffer. So um, going forward, I hope that somehow we can congeal these trips. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. We'll look at our standing district committees. There's really nothing from audit. We kind of heard from policy already yeah. today. Uh, Mike, anything that you want to mention about the budget? Uh, the oldest, so I wasn't there, uh, Carm, you guys or Brian? Yeah, uh, we just went over um, a lot of the question and answers from last time that came through uh, focused on mandates and what is a mandate versus what's not a mandate. So we ran through uh, several different items of what could be considered a mandate, uh, things we have to do. For instance, our Social Security bill, we have to pay that, uh, have to pay our pension bills. Those are, those are mandates for us. Um, otherwise, the IRS or the system is just going to swipe it from us. Um, and then got into some of the gray areas, you know, could be considered a mandate, couldn't be considered a mandate. You know, do we like the lights on right now? Technically, we don't have to have them on, but, you know, we want cold buildings, kind of warm buildings, somewhat warm buildings. So all those things that to support education, 
would you consider those a mandate? And we had discussions around that for a majority of the time. Uh, we got into talking about some star aspects, uh, tax changes, what could happen, and uh, you know, talked about um, one of the questions came through of uh, the impact on a Xerox settlement with the district and the town. Uh, what would come of that? What are some of the possibilities? Um, so it was, a, it was a good discussion for, and the hour went by very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so. Thank you. We heard from strategic plan already today. And anything about SEPTA, Tom or Sue? I was not able to meet the last meeting. Well, they actually had canceled the, the last, last meeting days. was canceled, but the last event was the bowling right. event. Mm -hmm. So Brennan and I bowled. It's okay. We broke 100, both of us, so. Yeah. Our whole team, no. Bumpers. <laughs> no bumpers. bumpers. And actually, our whole team, everyone broke 100, so. Um, but it was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know exactly how much money they raised, and Shelly's not here to tell us, but it was a lot of fun. And um, then their community fair is April 7th. We just talked about that, Mike. And it's really, it's a group of organizations and agencies that provide services and programs for families in the special needs community, and there'll be a whole variety of them. And, Probably be some activities and some food, that kind of thing, and it takes place in this auditorium. Thank you. Normally, I would introduce the consent agenda, but I'm going to ask Carmen to do that for us today. This is a this is a special consent agenda because part of your packet um, has uh, my recommendation for uh, the appointment of Mr. Dave Swinson. Um, as our new assistant superintendent for human resources beginning July 1st. So Dave is here in the audience and I just want to uh, say thanks to Dave for accepting um, uh, for accepting to come up to uh, <laughs> to the to the crazy floor um, to try to keep Brian and I in check and, uh, and between you and Shelley maybe you can do that but uh, anyway so it is it's a special night. Um, we know that Spry the staff and the students and the families at Spry are going to miss Mr. Swinson, who has been their principal for eight years. Eight years. Um, so, but he's just moving approximately 50 feet upstairs. Uh, so, Dave, welcome to the team. We can't wait until July 1st. All right, board members, besides the appointments, we also have the um, approval of the minutes, uh, recommendations on the Committee on Special Education, on preschool education, uh, the authorization of waivers, and the overnight trip, and the health letter request. I'll make that motion. Oh, okay, you have a question for it? Okay. Um, on that waiver, on number five, I've never seen this before, so I'm not sure what this is. <laughs> And that's the waiver for uh, Neil Flood. Right. Is he an employee or is he a contract worker? What is this? So um, for Neil Mr. Flood, Flood yeah. um, this is a waiver that um, because the, his position is a civil service position okay. as director of security, um, the, uh, and we have, um, there's no list for this position. There's no exam for this. This exam hasn't been given. Um, and so we need to uh, sign a waiver or have the Civil Service Commission sign off on a waiver um, each year so that we can continue to employ Mr. Flood um, without the Civil Service exam to take or the Civil Service list. So um, he is, uh, and, and, I, and, and Mike, I think there are some other rules and regulations because he's a retired sheriff or a retired mm -hmm. police officer. There's some other rules and regulations as well that we're being that are being waived um, or that that are part of the waiver process okay so yeah all right so yeah it, it's we act on this every year at this time i don't remember so. last year other questions no hidden away okay i'll make the motion no. thank you second please thank you mike all in favor of the consent agenda aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries before we motion for adjournment i just like to point out that next thursday we have a budget meeting at 6 30 here in the spry auditorium and our next regular meeting isn't until april 9th um, here at seven o'clock in the spry auditorium may we now have a motion please to adjourn paul seconds it all in favor 
Opposed? We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. <laughs>